1 Samuel chapter 8. We're going to read verses 1 through 9. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes, and they perverted justice. So then all the elders of Israel, they gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, Behold, you're old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the other nations. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are also doing this to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Father, we thank you for your precious word. Lord, we just ask that you would speak to us, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would move in this place this morning and that you would transform us, Lord, that uh, whatever it is that you need to do in us and our hearts, Lord, have your way in your people this morning. And we thank you in advance. In Jesus' name. So have you ever have you ever looked at something, someone, or some situation, and you look at that and you're like, man, only if, you know, that right there, that would make me happy. That right there would make me, that would make me happy. Only later to find out that the grass just looked greener on the other side of the fence. So that's what's going on with, with Israel. They um they're struggling. Their nation is a lot like Nicaragua. It's not doing well. The government is, is, is corrupt. They've been through this before with Eli's sons. They were corrupt. And now Samuel, he, he was a, a good judge, but now he's growing older. And his sons that he's appointed, they're, they're pretty corrupt themselves. The Bible says that they perverted, they perverted justice. And so instead of trusting God, they look to all the other Nations, They start looking over the fence at the grass on the other side. And because of this, they end up suffering the consequences. When life doesn't go the way that we expect it to, we too can end up seeking out solutions other than God. And it's during these crucial times, it's vital that we not dethrone Jesus in favor of what I'm going to call this morning, finite kings. So how can we make sure that Jesus stays on the throne of our lives when life throws us a curveball? The first thing we got to do is not be so quick to dismiss God's rule over the situation, whatever is going on in our lives, not be so quick to dismiss God. And the second thing is just to consider the alternative. So, don't be so quick to dismiss God's rule over the situation. You see, Samuel, he had these two sons that he appointed as, as, as judges, and he, he made a mistake right there, because if you go back to the book of Judges, during the time of Judges, see, they're not kings. They were not like kings, right? God would appoint the judges. When, when, when Israel would cry out for a deliverer, he would raise up these judges, and they would come, uh, they would come to the rescue, Right? And so when everything, when everything was at rest and good, you know, they were no longer, they didn't function as, as kings. And another thing that happened is it, it, it wasn't passed down from generation to generation. The, the, the father didn't pass on the, uh, uh, to his sons the office of a judge. It was God appointed. And so judges came from all different areas of the nation of Israel. But Samuel had appointed his two sons uh, as judge, and it has come back to Haunt them. They're a lot like Eli's sons. They were corrupt, and there there's reason for concern. There's reason that Israel uh, should be concerned here. That they should be uh, leery. That they should be upset about this. And so 
the elders of the nation, they come together and they come to Samuel and they say, hey, Samuel, obviously your sons are not like you and, and you're not getting any younger. You know, we've got, we've got an issue here. They're very corrupt. And so we want you to make us a king like all of these other nations. Now the question is, is, is it wrong for them to request a king? Because for all you Bible readers out there that know, that know your scriptures, God has already talked about a king being in Israel. From, from the very beginning of Genesis, all the way through the story up until now, God has spoken of a king. He, is, he has uh, prophesied that there would be a king. He's predicted that there would be a king. And in a lot of ways, he's even planned for there to be a king in Israel. Israel. It was a part of his plan. We see Genesis 35, Jacob. Now, remember, Jacob is the man who God changed his name to Israel, right? Israel has 12 sons, and as they multiply, as they have babies, they, they become the nation of, of Israel that we see here. So when it was just one man, when it was Jacob, God said to Jacob, he says, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply, a nation and a company of nations shall come from you. This is way back in Genesis 35. Kings shall come from your own body. So here we see God talking about, um, about uh, kings coming from Israel. And then Genesis 49.10, Jacob, now he's, a, he's, a, um, he's an old man. And he's saying a blessing over his children. Now back in ancient times it wasn't just... You know, God bless you or may things be well with you. It worked as, as, as prophecy. It said something about their destiny, about their future. And he's prophesying. He's blessing his son Judah. He's blessing each one of his sons. And he says that the scepter, you know, a king's scepter. He says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his, his feet. And so that's saying that the kingship is going to, uh, its intent is to come through the tribe of Judah, it's to come through his son uh, Judah, and, and, and we see that David was from the tribe of Judah. In fact, the true king, the Messiah, Jesus, he was from the tribe of Judah. So there again, we see uh, that God had uh, planned for a king. He had predicted a king. And then we see in the law, in the book of the law, the law of Moses, Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 and 15, uh, God actually says this. He's, he's actually predicting this moment that we're reading about in 1 Samuel chapter 8. He says, when you, Israel, when you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you. See, this is when they were in the wilderness before they crossed the river Jordan into the promised land. He says this to them. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it, and you dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the other nations around me. See, God saw this. Isn't that, isn't that something? Like, God knows what you're going to do ten years from now. It's, 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 it's. When you come into the nation, you dwell in it, and then you say, I will set a king over me like all the other nations. And that's good. It's comforting. I mean, especially as a Christian, because God gives us free will, free choices, but our lives are, are in His hands. If we would just place it there, you know what I mean? He's got it. He's got it under God's got it. You know, He's in control. He is the king. He's the one that's enthroned. So you're going to say, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I want, we want to set a king over us like all the other nations around us. Verse 15, you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. So we see that God planned for a king. So was it wrong that they asked for a king? I mean, did God see something? Did he see government or kingship is, is evil? And the truth is, is no, God, God doesn't see uh, government as evil. In fact, God is the one who institutes uh, government. Romans 13, 1, Apostle Paul says, he says, let every person, all right, so he's talking to the church in Rome, but as an extension, he speaks to us today, all right, so every person gathered in this room, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted. By God. So does that mean like these corrupt governor, you know, these corrupt uh, politicians like in Nicaragua and even sometimes in our nation or these dictators of the world or worst case scenario, the Adolf Hitlers of the world? Does that mean that God, that's his, 
his will for for he put them in place so that they could cause destruction. No, that's not what that's not what is being said here. God instituted the uh, the institution of government. He put government in place. Government has its purpose because we live in a fallen, broken world, and you need government to bring order. Right? Everything would be chaos. Anarchy is not. The way we need government because of our brokenness, because of our sinfulness, because man breaks laws, and so we need government there to enforce those laws and to keep order in the land. So he says, especially Christians, we should we should obey those laws unless it flies in the face of God. Then we have permission to go against those laws. The issue here, though, with Israel is not that they not that they just requested the office of a king. The issue is that they were not trusting God as their king. That's what's really going on here. And it's the same with man. No, nothing's changed. When we choose to step outside of, of God's reign, we find that we do the same exact thing. And so Samuel, he's, he's upset with them. He's, he, he, he's, he's angry. And so he goes to God. He brings it to the Lord in prayer. And there's a lesson right there, you know. When you're angry, when you're upset, when you're frustrated, the first place that we should go to is God. A lot of times when, when I think Christians are the worst at this, when we're mad, especially if we're mad at God, you know, if we're frustrated with the situation, we want to hide. We want to be like Adam and Eve. We want to hide behind the fig leaves. We want to hide behind, behind the trees from God. But when you're angry and frustrated, the best place you can be is before God. Saying, God, I am angry. I'm upset about this, and I don't like it. And I'm furious. That's the best place to be. Because what God doesn't like, you know, the, the, the lie of the enemy is like, hey, don't tell God that. You, you want to make God mad? You know, you don't want, you don't want to come to God with your frustrations and, and with, with your anger. But no, God, that's the perfect place he wants, to, uh, wants us to be. Because when we don't, when we hide it, when we put on a facade, you know, when we act like everything is okay, that's what's wrong with religious people. You know, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, all those religious elite, when Jesus came, they always acted like they were perfect. They never came to God and said, hey, I'm broken, you know. And so when you're frustrated, when there's a sense, you know, I've got a high sense of justice, you know, that, that sometimes gets, gets out of control. In some ways it's good, but in some ways it's like, you know, I make it all about me and my opinions and my ways and you come against that or I see injustice, then, then my teeth come out, you know? But if you're like that, if you're like me, just take it before God. Take it before God. Anyways, Samuel, though, uh, unlike me a lot of times, he has reason to be upset. And there's a righteous anger. And he's, he's upset at the unrighteousness of this request by Israel because he knows where their heart's at. He knows what's going on here. And so he comes before God and God's answer is, hey, Samuel, it's cool. Listen to them, all right? And imagine Samuel's like, what? He's like, listen to them. Because what's really going on here? They're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. They're rejecting me. You know, Jesus says the same thing to us. Uh, he says it in the Gospels. He says to the disciples, he's like, hey, when you're going out and you're letting your light shine, if you're letting your light shine, if you're, if you're living for Jesus, if you're living for the King, there's going to be people that don't like you. There's going to be people that uh, reject you. And Jesus says, hey, they're not rejecting you. They're really rejecting me. So there's a word for us here as well. So he says, hey, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. What's going on here is, is they're rejecting me. You know, they're, they're rejecting me because they're not trusting me in this situation. Yeah, things are going on, but haven't I always delivered them? You know, that's, that's, that's the reasoning here. Haven't I always been uh, God? Haven't I always saved them from themselves, basically, you know? They weren't trusting God. And, and they were saying that we know better than God by choosing a king, you know? Not by, by trusting him when it was his appointed time to raise up a king. They were saying, hey, we know better. These other nations... They're doing it right. We're the ones doing it wrong here. I mean, this is a theocracy. This is the one nation that God is working through, and they're basically saying, no, nah, we're not doing it right. We need to do it like these other nations. God says, no, nah, they're rejecting me, Samuel. That's what's going on here. We do the same thing when we say to God that we know better, you know? When we make choices that we know better in our lives, you know, we know better about relationships. We know, uh, 
we know what's going to make us happy. We know what's going to bring fulfillment. And we choose these other things over God. We're telling God that we know better than he does. God says to Israel, they're doing this uh, by constantly chasing other gods. They've been doing this from, from the moment we left uh, Egypt. From the moment I brought them out of Egypt, they constantly keep saying that I'm not good enough. And they keep chasing after these other nations' gods, which indeed are not gods at all. God was never good enough for Israel. So is the heart of mankind to this day. We haven't changed. Times have changed. Hearts are still the same. People are seeking anything but the one true God. And we talked about that a few weeks ago. I mean, people are willing to, to give a personification to the universe instead of calling out to the one true God. We don't want anything to do with God. We want to we want to solve this solution. You know, you ever been in a situation and, and people are talking about the problems? You're like, well, the problem really is is we need to turn to God. Or we, you know, we we need Jesus in this situation. Let's, let's keep the whole religious thing out. You can't separate it. You can't separate the two. When it comes to the heart of man, we need a Savior. We need a Redeemer. We need Jesus. The heart of man hasn't changed. I will put my trust in my will. I will put my trust in my philosophies. I will allow this thing over here to be my God. I will allow this thing over here to have a rule over me. I believe that this thing is going to make me happier than God. This thing will rule over me as king. And so how easy is it to look at the world for these finite kings while we give the infinite God the cold shoulder without examining the ramifications of such choices. So the second thing we got to do is, is like Consider the alternative <laughs> to not choosing God, to choosing these other kings over God. God says to Samuel, he says, Samuel, give them a king. Grant their request. But I want you to warn them what this kingship is going to look like. You see, Israel, uh, they only thought about the military might. You know, not only were, were Samuel's uh, sons corrupt, but they were like at other times, they were having problems with their enemies. You know, their enemies were winning the battles. And so all they saw was the military might of these other nations and the faults of these current judges. You know, the grass seemed much greener on the other side of the fence. But they had not thought it through. You know? And so, in life, things get, things get, uh, we all go through the storms, right? We all go through the valleys. And the temptation is, as we look over here and we see, we see people flourishing, right? In ungodly ways. You know, we see philosophies that fly in the face of, of, of God, that fly in the face of the Bible, and we're tempted. We look over there and we see that the grass, it looks a lot greener. And so that's the temptation. But here's the thing, have you really thought it through? Have you really thought it through? We're ready to jump the fence and run to the pasture. God says to Israel, he says, you sure about this? He said, you know, kings, they bring in a host of issues. You're only thinking about the good stuff. You're seeing this through rose-colored glasses. I mean, they come with power trips. They can take more than they give. At best, you'll be their servants. At worst, you're going to be their slaves. Like verse 11, starting at verse 11, it says, he says, this is how a king will reign over you. The king will draft your sons and assign them to his chariots and his charioteers, making them run before his chariots. Some will be generals and captains in his army. In a kingship, it requires a lot. Some will be forced to plow in his fields and harvest his crops, and some will make his weapons and chariot equipment. Verse 13, the king will take your daughters from you and force them to cook and bake and make perfumes for him. He will take away the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his officials. Common theme here. Verse 15. He will take a tenth of your grain and your grape harvest and distribute it among his officers and attendants. He will take your male and female slaves and 
demand the finest of your cattle and donkeys for his own use. He will demand a tenth of your flocks, and you will be his slaves. When that day comes, you will beg for relief from this king you are demanding, but then the Lord will not help you. You see, not only will your finite kings fail to provide all those things that you're really seeking for in life, all the things, you know, when we're chasing these, these other things in life, we're really seeking joy and fulfillment and, and wholeness and peace. Every, every single human being in this earth, those are the things that we're really seeking after, where we're going down empty avenues. Not only will these finite kings fail to provide that in the end, there may be a time where it flourishes, but they'll take from you. They'll take from you that that drug, whatever your drug is, whatever that looks like, it looks enticing. That 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 woman, that man, who's not your who's not your husband. That selfish pursuit that you're going after, where you're not thinking about anybody else really, but but yourself. That decision that you know is not from God in your heart of hearts. It'll decay you from the inside. It will rob from you. It will steal your joy. It will steal your peace. It will take from you. Number two, they'll take from others. Those finite kings that we chase after, they take from others. You see, your sins aren't your own choices, you know? We think, you know, a lot of times we think, hey, I'm choosing to do this. What's a little harm in that? You know, it's, it, it, this is about me. It's not affecting other people. But your sins aren't choices that only affect you. They leave a trail of destruction in the lives of other people. Any of you ever been a part of a church split? I have. You know, the backbiting. You know, it, 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 it destroys. It destroys lives. It hurts people. It leaves a trail of destruction in its path. People leave the faith over that type of stuff. And when we're living ungodly lives, when we choose our own way instead of God's, people see. And it affects them. And it hurts them. Jesus said, whoever calls as one of these little ones, God's children, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. That's how seriously God takes the way we live our lives in the face of others, when we lead people, when we become a stumbling block to others. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 26, he says, if one member of the church suffers, right? The Bible says the, the, we're the body of Christ. All of us here, we're one body. You know, Jesus is the head, and ever since he ascended into heaven, he sent out his Holy Spirit, we go and we function as his body in the world. The church does. And so if one member of that body suffers, it affects everybody. All suffer, Paul says. It takes from others. So they'll take from you. Those finite kings will take from others. And they'll enslave you. You know? We look at that sin, we look at that that that, that venture, that that, that, that that field, that grass that's green on the other side, and it looks enticing, you know? And you dwell on it. You know, temptation is one of those things like just to be tempted is not is not a sin. Jesus was tempted, you know. So when the temptation comes, you're not you're not walking in sin at that moment. But what happens is that temptation comes and you start dwelling on it. And then all of a sudden you let it linger and it becomes overwhelming. You start to become a slave to it. It starts to become overwhelming, and then soon you find yourself diving in. And you're a slave. And over time, you know what happens? When there's no confession, when you never bring it to the table of God's grace, when you never confess it to the Lord, a numbing effect happens. And you stop caring. Then all of a sudden, you don't care anymore. And you're far from repenting. You find yourself falling deeper and deeper. They'll enslave you. And they'll draw you away from God. Isaiah 59, the prophet says, he says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save. And God's hand is not too short that he can't save, you know. 
nor is his ear dull that he cannot hear. God hears all things. He hears every word that we speak. He hears every thought that we think. He hears every prayer. So, he's the only one. He alone can save. He has the power to save. He can save who he chooses, right? And he hears all things. That's what Isaiah is saying here. He says, but your sins have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you that he does not hear. You see, and if, if you don't know Lord Jesus, if you never called upon the name of the Lord, I mean, you're separated from, the, the truth is, I didn't say it, the Bible says it, you're separated from God. But that's not what God wants for you. He wants to reconcile you back to himself. He wants to call you his child. He wants you to be able to call him daddy because he created you and he put his image in you, right? And that's been distorted by our rebellion, by our sin, and God wants to call you home by his grace. Remember this morning? By grace we have been saved through faith and not of ourselves and no one can boast. There's nothing we can do. He just wants us to trust Him. He wants us to trust Him. You know, the Bible is more about, less about morality, you know, doing right and wrong, and more about idolatry. He wants us, you know, all those moral things or whatever. That's just an overflow of the life of, of, of Christ. He wants our attention. He wants our affections. That's what God wants from us. And so you see that theme of idolatry over and over again in Scripture. When Israel flees from God, they have fallen into the sin of idolatry. But what happens, even as Christians, We know the truth of the gospel. You know, Jesus said, no one can snatch you out of my hand. You belong to me. He has raised us up into heavenly places. We're his children. We, we, we rest in that. But the thing is, is, when we persist in sin, what happens is we feel that separation from God. Have you ever been in a place in your life, in your walk, all right, you say, I know I, know I love Jesus, but I, I sure ain't, I, I'm sure not acting like it. And you feel distance from God. You feel close. You feel separated from God, right? You ever felt like that? Even though you know the truth of Scripture and what He says about you, you feel separated from God? Let me tell you, that's intentional. That's because God loves you too much to let you just continue in your sin. And what happens is when we continue in our sin, God stops listening to us. He stops listening to our prayers because they're selfish. They're about us. Paul says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, he says, don't quench, don't snuff out the Spirit of God. Do you know we can do that? We can snuff out uh, the Spirit of God. We can quench the Spirit. We can extinguish that flame that, that God burns within us. How do we do that? When we backbite, when we don't love one another, when we chase these finite kings instead of God, when we persist in our ways and not in God's ways, because we plug our ears. We do this to God. Just don't do that. It's not what you're made for. So these things, these, these things that we choose over God, these finite kings that we choose to have their rule over us instead of God, they, they draw us away from God. And finally, they'll destroy us. Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There's a way that seems good, it seems pleasant, it seems, it seems reasonable, but it leads to death. The wages of sin is death, Paul says. Our salary for sin, our earnings for sin, is, is death. It destroys us. But thank God, right, the free gift... You read the rest of the verse, Romans 6, 23, the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the good news. That's the calling, is to dethrone these things in our lives and turn, turn back to the one true God, the infinite King, the only one who can bring us joy and peace and contentment and wholeness and purpose and life. So God tells Israel, he says, hey, you want this king? 
you know, I'm warning you. Is that what you want? Because if you want it, go at it. But here's the thing, you're going to cry out and I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to allow you to suffer the consequences. And so we ask, how could a loving God do that? How could a God tell his people, you're going to cry out to me and I'm not going to come rescue you? Why would God do that? So in Scotland, a shepherd and a sheep, they're, they're, they're in the mountain, mountainous uh, ranges and stuff. And so these, these sheep, a lot of times, they will see grassy areas that are below them, sometimes as far as you know, 10 or 12 feet deep. And uh, not only is the, 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 the grass pretty and green, but it's also it's got a sweeter taste in some areas. And so these sheep... They're enticed by that, so they'll actually jump down <laughs> to these areas where they can where they can graze. But when they when they jump down there, it's so far down they they have no way of of getting back up. And so they eat a little bit, and then they start crying out, you know, for for help. And the shepherd hears this, but he doesn't do anything about it. He lets them he lets them whine. And so sheep are dumb; they forget about it for a little bit, and they start eating, you know, more and more grass. So. The shepherd waits for uh, not only for the the um, the sheep to eat all of the grass, right? He lets he waits beyond that until the sheep is so weak it's fallen down and it's about to die, and then finally the shepherd they'll tie one shepherd on a rope and they'll bring him down and they'll go and rescue the sheep out of the the claws of, of death. Why would they do that? Why would they wait? Why wouldn't they rescue the sheep when, when they jump down there in the first place? Why wouldn't they go after them? I mean, what kind of shepherd does that, right? I mean, how is that loving and caring for your sheep? The problem is, is again, sheep are dumb, right? And so if they immediately went down there to rescue the sheep, the sheep would scatter and they would fall off the cliff to their death. They have to wait until they're spent. To at the, they're at their weakest. It's the same way with man. There's a reason that uh, I think that we're called sheep. You see, we won't go back to God. We, we choose our own kings. We go after those selfish pursuits, those unfulfilling pursuits. And we're so prideful. We don't turn to God until we don't have any friends. We've lost everything. We've burned all of our bridges. You know, I, I, I knew a young man once who blamed God for his own, his own choices, you know. He had done some things that had gotten him in his, his situation in life. And instead of looking to God, he said, God, how foolish I am, you know. God, forgive me for my sins. Lord, forgive me for this. Lord, I messed up. Remember I say, come to God with those things? Anger, sin, whatever it is. That's exactly where God wants you. Daddy wants you right there in his arms saying, God, I, I messed up. I, I can't do this on my own. But instead, this, this, this young man blamed God for the things he did that directly got him in the situation that he was in. How could God do this to me? Well, because God doesn't raise brats. God's a good parent. A lot of times, I, think, I really think in, in our day and age, we don't understand the love of God. I mean, we're all, I think, through the ages, we've been trying to wrap our minds around the love of God. But I think we don't understand the love of God because we don't know what it we don't know what it means to love. Love properly. We don't know what it means to be a good parent. You know, you know, back in the day, you know, uh, people raised their children, and, and there was, you know, maybe, maybe abuse, or they were they were too harsh, you know, and they had this view of God as a as a lightning striker. And now we just we let our kids do whatever, and so we expect God to do the same thing. God doesn't function like that. He's the perfect parent. He's the perfect parent. So what does God do when you're like that sheep and you've jumped down to that what you thought was greener pasture and then all of a sudden you realize that you can continue to persist and wallow in those choices and in your sins? He waits. He waits patiently until you're spent. 
But Israel, they refused to listen to Samuel's warning. And they told Samuel, they said, no, we want a king. We want to be like those other nations. Worship team, would you come up? Let me close by saying this. If the world's lawn looks greener than God's lawn, artificial turf. It's not real. It's, it's, a, it's a facade. So ask yourself this morning, are you being tempted to turn to other kings? What other finite kings, what other things in your life are you choosing your way instead of God's? And here's the thing. If you've chosen a way that's not God, if you're currently living in these other pastures, fleeing from God, you chose your own way, have you been spent yet? And will you put Jesus back on the throne? 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's good news. It's good news. Like Kristen said this morning, he said, if you've already called upon the name of Jesus, it's all been atoned for. It's already taken care of. But you're in a relationship. Confess your sins to the Lord. If you've never called upon the name of Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Call out to him, and he will make you a child of the true king, <laughs> that infinite king. See, because the, the reality is, is that your finite kings cannot fulfill the longing of your heart. Whatever direction that you're going that is not of God. And I've told, I've told people this before. That have chosen their own way. I said, I say this out of the utmost love that I can. I hope you're miserable. I hope you're miserable. Until you come back to God. I don't pray for blessing down the road that you're going. Because I know you will only be made whole in the arms of the King. It's only Jesus. Only Jesus can fulfill the longing of your heart. We were created for God. We were created for God. And if God created us for God, we can't find fulfillment in anything else, any other pursuit that is not of God. It's a dead end road. And so we can persist, we can thumb our nose at God, and we can keep going our own way. There's a way that seems right to man, and in its way, it leads to death. God doesn't want.